Hello, YA fantasy and adventure fans, and welcome to episode two of Brielle D. Porter's Jester. My name is Kayla, and this is CamCat Unwrapped. Previously on Jester, Lizette has finally become a headliner for the Saguaro Hotel, but she's still far from the eyes of the queen. And pulling a gun mid-act on rival Luke might not have been the best move. Lizette must watch her back while planning a show that even the queen can't ignore. Does she have what it takes? Chapter 7 Edward closes his eyes, searches his memories for the right bylaw. His father watches him expectantly. It does not matter that he is the firstborn son. Nothing less than a perfect score on the apprentice's exam will secure his position as heir to his father's magic. And with less than 12 hours left until the exam, Edward cannot seem to cram enough knowledge into his brain. Section 73. He begins triumphantly when the door to the study bursts open, followed by wailing. Like a bullet, his sister launches herself at him, nearly knocking him into the bookshelves. Edward! Tell her I won't do it, his little sister says, not so little anymore at twelve, her splotchy face buried in his robes. What is the meaning of this? His father snaps at the nursemaid, who always trails his sister just a little too slowly. I tried to stop her, the nursemaid says, panting. Hey, no, Edward says, patting his sister's heaving back. He can feel his father's gaze like lead weighing on him. What's wrong? She looks up at him, eyes watery. They've assigned me to Madame Luell. The smile on his lips feels suddenly false, too cheery. The seamstress? She nods, squaring her shoulders, even though her wet lashes still threaten to spill over. I won't do it, Edward. I won't be apprenticed to a seamstress. You ungrateful child, their father says, rounding on her. After everything we've done to secure you such a prestigious apprenticeship. But Papa, I want to apprentice with you, his sister breaks in. Please just give me a chance. Before their father can purple any deeper, Edward catches his sister's arm gently. Lisette, you know Papa can only take on one apprentice. He doesn't add what they both know, that he was chosen long before she was born, that their father's blood magic can be passed on only to a single heir, that she'd never even had a chance. At his touch, all the fight goes out of her. She slumps in one of the high-backed leather chairs, eyes red. Madame Luell is a renowned seamstress, Edward adds. You really are lucky, you know. The lie tastes like ashes on his tongue. He tries not to think of his sister's messy attempts at embroidery, her inability to sit still. Surely, though, she will grow into her apprenticeship just as he has grown into his. But I want magic like you, Lisette bursts out. Edward's heart twists at the raw emotion on her face. Enough! Their father slams a hand against his desk, startling Lisette. Hattie? Kindly remove the child so we can return to Edward's studies. Hattie scurries in to obey, grasping Lisette by the arm. Come now, Lisette. Lisette wrenches her arm free, but follows Hattie reluctantly from the room. Edward tries to catch her eye as she leaves, throws her one last encouraging smile. But she does not look at him again, the door gliding shut behind her. Chapter 8 The saguaro squats, like the cactus it was named for, in the sagebrush district of Oasis. It's still on the main strip, but farther down, at a respectful distance from its luxury cousins. The designer boutiques have faded into kitschy souvenir shops and liquor stores. A towering cactus stands in front of the entrance, which would be impressive if not for the tacky cowboy hat someone has stuck on top. The landscape would best be described as manicured desert, 
although manicured is a stretch. Sweeps of red rock and smaller versions of the cactus out front dot the sparse grounds. I wrinkle my nose. Rock means scorpions. The hotel itself is faded, beaten by years of sun and desert wind, but still majestic. Everything is as well-maintained as an aging whore. I squint up at the sparkling letters that spell out, Welcome to the fabulous Saguaro Hotel and Casino, and wonder if it doubles as a brothel, like many of the lower-end hotels. All in all, though, it's a decent hotel. Miles above Bird of Paradise, miles beneath the crown. I grip my teeth and clutch my meager belongings. It's a journey, I remind myself, picking through the scattered rock to the entrance. You're farther than you were yesterday. But the truth pricks at me like a bundle of cactus needles. Still not good enough. The door attendant is as faded as the hotel itself, his wrinkled uniform dusty. He opens the doors for me without a word, and my heart sinks even further. Any hotel willing to let someone like myself in without question is not exactly a classy establishment. Resigned, I make my way up to the front desk, which is made of sandstone. A bleached bison skull stares sightlessly from the heavy wooden beam above the lobby. The receptionist, a plump girl with the thickest eyelashes I've ever seen, smiles at me. Another bad sign. Welcome to the Saguaro. Are we checking in today? I look around to see if perhaps I was followed in by another patron, but it's just me. The receptionist's name badge reads Ellie May. I'm the new headliner for the Saguaro. Rose said to talk to you about a room. Of course. The receptionist chirps, pulling out the guest list. It's a faded ledger with so many blots and crossouts I wince. Her pen tracks the page leaving behind a faint black line until it hits my name with an excited smudge. Oh, a magician, how exciting. What sorts of magic tricks do you perform? I've never met someone who talked solely in exclamation marks before. It's exhausting just listening to her. However, I can never pass up the opportunity to talk about my show. Oh, you know, knives, fire, death-defying feats, revenge. I say airily, as though discussing the weather. Nobody likes a braggart, after all. The usual. Ellie May's eyes are round. Well, it sounds extraordinary. Perhaps I can check it out after one of my shifts. I'd be honored, I say, and this time I mean it. Ellie May hands me two scratched keys shaped like cacti, one for theater access and one for my room. There's also an all-day buffet she says, puffing out her chest. It's one of the big attractions around here. The smile fades from my face. The Crown Hotel boasts an in-house restaurant catered by a world-class chef, but here, I can have all the shrimp cocktails I want. Food poisoning too, no doubt. Thanks, I say grimly, and Ellie May points me to the stairs because of course the elevator is broken. I'm on the fourth floor, so after a bit of huffing and puffing, I reach my room. There's a cigarette burn in the carpet, which is dotted with tired-looking coyotes. But other than that, it's not bad. A crisp, clean white bed, a clawfoot tub, and even my very own cactus. I sit on the bed, well-worn springs giving it my weight. It really is a vast improvement over Bird of Paradise, I think absently, tapping the end of a particularly menacing cactus needle. No bed bugs, at least. It's a stepping stone is all, a temporary stop. The queen will be here in two days, which means I have only two days to make sure my name is as well known as Luke's. The next morning, after a bath in the tepid water that never seems to get cold enough despite the extensive groaning from the pipes, I make my way down to the Saguaro Theater, my theater. A framed advertisement next to the doors showcases the Saguaro's past headliner, Cassidy Bell. Cactus needles protrude from every inch of available flesh on her body, even her eyeballs. I wince. Apparently, Cassidy's magical ability was extreme pain tolerance. It's not difficult to figure out why she was fired. With only one ability, most magicians lack the versatility needed to stay fresh and keep up ticket sales, which, as it happens, is my strength. 
pushing open the garish teal doors, eyes still adjusting to the dimness of the theater, I take in the space. Candelabras, more suited to a haunted house than a theater, hang over a cluster of tables offering a meager halo of yellowish light. The tables are small, designed to house only four audience members each. The stage itself is only a few paces long, two steps above the rest of the theater. I finger the tasseled ropes tying back moth-eaten velvet curtains. Staring out at the tables, I quickly calculate how many guests the tiny theater can manage. The number is grim, 50 at full capacity. My heart sinks. The Panthers Theater can seat at least 500, the crown as many as 1,000. Smaller is not always worse, I remind myself. It's a different setup than I expected, but it allows a level of intimacy between the performers and the audience. I make a mental note to work the tables into my next show. A moth beats itself against the light of one of the candelabras, casting frenetic shadows across the room. I sit on the stage, which isn't even high enough for my legs to dangle off the edge, my boots scuffing the stained carpet. I have a theater, dingy and cramped though it may be. Now all I need is a show. I need an act good enough to get the queen to the saguaro. It's not hard to see why the jester is almost always chosen from the crown acts. For you to be considered for jester, the queen must attend one of your performances. Only those lucky few will be allowed to perform in the final show when the queen selects the next jester. The queen rarely deigns to leave the crown during her visits to Oasis. Rumor has it she hardly even leaves her rooms, much less the hotel itself. So competitors get creative trying to attract her attention. I need to get in front of her somehow, find a way to stand out from a sea of other performers. After bribing a crown housekeeper, I find out the queen's exact arrival time to Oasis. I pass not one, but two monstrous billboards featuring Luke as the Panther's jester act, not including the massive one hulking next to the crown. I plant myself as far away from his leer as possible, trying hard to ignore the way his eyes track me, even on an advertisement. A small crowd has gathered when the queen's motor car pulls up, despite all attempts to be discreet. The car is nondescript, the sort of bland luxury car every courtier drives an oasis. If it weren't for my tip, I'd never have guessed this was the queen. A large man in a dark suit stands mute, holding open the door as the queen exits. I've never seen the queen in person, so it's strange at first to see the woman whose image graces the giant painting in the lobby of the Crown Hotel. She is pale, almost translucent. Gold hair catches the sunlight which she squints against. Before she can even raise a hand to block the sun, an umbrella is deployed, shielding her fragile complexion. Here is a woman who has never had to open a single door for herself. Her heavy velvet dress hangs on her, wilting in the heat. She looks like a relic, a traveler from a different time, and she is as out of place here in Oasis as feathers on a tarantula. Turning, she plucks a tiny girl from the car. The girl is just as preposterously dressed as the queen, in a dress dripping with so many bows she looks like a cake topper. This must be the crown princess. Instead of the pallor of her mother, red blooms on her cheeks, and her little rosebud lips purse in disapproval at the sweltering heat. The queen anxiously fusses, brushing away the child's sweaty curls, then passes her to a nearby attendant. Swaying on her feet, the queen pays no heed to the assortment of curious onlookers. She takes the proffered arm of a bodyguard, her thin arms as frail as an 80-year-old woman, and ducks into the hotel without a word. It's a disappointment after waiting so long, and rather than sating my curiosity about the mysterious woman I'll be competing for, it does nothing but stoke it. Just can't stay away from me, can you? I jump when I realize the real-life version of Luke is standing just beneath his billboard counterpart, an identical sneer on his lips. I was hoping I might get the chance to shoot you again, I retort, praying he didn't see how badly he startled me. My heart gallops like a runaway horse. Luke smiles, revealing gleaming teeth. Even though I know his ability better than anyone else, it's still jarring to see how quickly he managed to heal himself. His mouth should be ruined after what I did to him. 
and yet there's not a trace of the blast that ripped through him, not so much as a smudge of gunpowder on his full lower lip. It's a pity this is as close to the queen as you'll ever get, Luke muses, stepping closer. Without meaning to, I instinctively step back. His smile turns predatory. Her majesty can't be subjected to the sort of drivel the saguaro turns out, of course. He continues, running a hand through his long hair. How he found out about the saguaro so fast is a mystery. Maybe I'll just come to her then. I'm mesmerized against my will, a trembling sparrow in the presence of a rattlesnake. Luke lets out a loud laugh. I'd be disappointed if you didn't, little Liz. I freeze at the nickname, trying hard not to remember the other boy who called me that name once, long ago. It's enough to break the hold Luke has over me, at least. I cross the remainder of the distance between us, so close I can feel his breath on my lips. He smells like oranges and lies. There are worse things than being shot, you know, I remind him softly. His answering smile is grim. I have known more of hell than you could ever dream. I pause, disarmed. Those golden eyes track my lips hungrily, as gravity and something else pulls me ever closer. Like a dreamer falling out of sleep, I wrench myself away. Hell has nothing on me. I respond and leave him there beneath his billboard. How does Luke always manage to get under my skin? I stomp away from the crown, teeth grinding. I'm so distracted I almost walk straight into a shimmering wall of heat. Acrid smoke blooms from flames which are rapidly eating the facade of a blazing theater. I stare, brain blank, trying to figure out if I should look for water or call for help. When the front door opens, although there's hardly a front door left to open, most of it charred beyond recognition, the person takes their time shutting the blackened door carefully. My eyes water as I squint at the person, blurred around the edges from the heat of the blaze, but seemingly uninjured. Hello? I call because I have no idea what else to say. Are you okay? Bugger. A tall, gangly young man in his mid-twenties or so marches, resigned from the inferno to meet me. He looks as if he were born from the fire itself, so it's streaked on both high cheekbones. Ash floats from the sky, settling on his hair and shoulders, flakes of gray snow against his messy black hair. The one time I commit arson and someone catches me in the act. Just my luck. He pulls off a pair of filthy spectacles, absently wiping them on his sooty shirt, streaking even more grime on them in the process. I goggle at him, at the inferno raging behind him. How did you do that? Grabbing my arm, the boy steers me away from the burning building, his footsteps purposeful. I don't know what you're referring to, he says as he pulls me along, lips thin. Behind us, there's a splintering crash as the building marquee topples to the ground. It occurs to me then that I may have just been taken hostage. Snapping my arm out of his grasp, I yank the vial of euphoria from my pocket and hold it in front of me like a shield. Don't you dare try anything, I warn or I'll throw this hex right in your face. The boy's face is pleasantly confused. What on the beard of a goat skull would I try? I'm just getting away from the scene of the crime. You asked a question, and I thought it would only be polite to bring you along so I could answer. I gape at him, the vial in my hand wavering. Fire magicians are rare, and I've never seen one that could walk through fire completely impervious. How did you do that? I demand, shaking the vial at him for good measure. The boy's eyes grow shifty. I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Speechless, I gesture wildly in the direction of the building, billowing black clouds visible even from where we stand a good mile away. He sighs. Oh, that. It's quite a long story. I'm sure you don't have the time. Show me how. The boy stares at me, mouth slightly agape. Excuse me? I want you to show me how you did that. Teach me, I repeat. If I could learn magic like that, there's nothing that would stop me from becoming Jester. I can't just teach you. Sure you can. I'm breathing hard. My throat burns from the fire. Because you're going to make me your heir. 
The boy's eyes widen. I don't think so. I do. I can hardly believe the words escaping my lips, words formed from desperation and smoke. Because I have evidence that could land you a quick execution. Intentional arson, statute 67B. The boy stares at me. I memorized the heavy book of laws the year I turned eight. That was before I'd understood my father would never want me for an apprentice. I could kill you right here, right now, you know. Flames spark in his hands. I have no doubt you could, I respond, pretending the sight of both his hands bursting into flame doesn't unsettle me. But something tells me you won't. I'm betting an awful lot on my gut feelings about a stranger. His hands clench and unclench as he considers me. Oh, very well, but not here. Looking around, as though expecting a squadron of guards at any second, he darts down an alleyway, and I have no choice but to follow him. He ducks and twists down nooks and crannies in such a bizarre, illogical pattern that I wonder if he's trying to lose me. A quick, disappointed look over his shoulder when he spots me keeping pace confirms my suspicions. I hurry my steps so I match his stride, even though his legs are far longer than my own. My lungs burn hotter than the flames eating the theater behind us, but there's no way I'm letting him get away now. Finally, the boy huffs to a stop in front of a bookshop. I stare up at the faded sign over the door, the book emporium. Below the hours is a large, closed notice, hanging crookedly. I honestly didn't even know he had a bookshop in Oasis, let alone one for used books. The boy makes an impatient noise, and it's then I realize he has been standing there holding the door open for me. I hurry past him into the cramped store, which is tiny but pristine. Orderly rows of book spines peer out, organized neatly by author and category. T. I jump as the boy nudges me with a dainty ivory teacup. The handle is shaped like a carp, I realize with some amusement. Do you work here or something? I ask, taking the cup from him more out of surprise than actual need. Peppermint-scented steam wafts from the tea, tickling my nose. No, I own it. Folding himself neatly into a large armchair that looks as though it's older than Oasis itself, the boy balances his own teacup on his knee and takes a leisurely sip. I gape around the shop. Please sit down. The boy motions me toward another armchair, this one covered in gaudy pink roses. I hesitate unsure if we should even bother with pleasantries. Come now, I've even given you the good chair. I sit reluctantly. I lied. The boy picks at a bit of emerald fuzz on the arm of his chair. It matches his own startlingly green eyes. I gave you the chair with the saggy middle. It's clear he's going to make this as difficult as possible. I can't say I blame him. Conceding the loss, I settle into the saggy chair. The springs are tired, but it's surprisingly comfortable, the worn velvet cool against my skin. There's a soft thud as a scowling gray cat lands on my knee, startling me. Its face is squashy, and it eyes me disdainfully before curling into my lap. George likes you, the boy says, sipping his tea. He's usually right about people. I smile. But obviously not about you, he adds. My smile falters. Who are you, is all I can manage. The boy slaps a palm to his head. Ugh, how dreadfully embarrassing. All the blackmailing made me forget basic etiquette, it appears. I'm silly and forge. I specialize in rare and occult books. And arson? I throw him a wry smile, stroking George's long matted fur. You really must stop bringing that up. Cillian says, shaking his head. You're a witness. I've never committed a crime before. I have no idea what to do with a witness. Kill you, perhaps? I throw up my hands, upsetting George, who casts me an irritable look. You wouldn't dare. Perhaps. Perhaps not. George settles back on my lap once he's certain I'll stay good and still. I have no idea what to make of Cillian. He's like an 80-year-old dowager stuck in a young man's body. Why did you set the theater on fire anyway? 
I ask, sneaking a cookie from the plate between us. None of your business, Cillian says, sniffing. He gestures to my tea. You better drink that before it gets cold. I lift the cup to my lips, and the smell of mint with an acrid undertone wrinkles my nose. I set the cup down and raise an eyebrow at Cillian. Poison? Really? Cillian throws a hand to his heart in mock offense. I would never. Then that was the worst smelling cup of tea I've ever been offered. This seems to offend him more than my accusation. Dumping the contents of both cups down the drain, he refills them both from the same kettle and takes a sip, keeping his eyes on me the entire time. It could still be a trick, but I'm parched. I decide to risk it. This cup smells delicious, with notes of cool mint and rose. It soothes my dry throat. Attempted murder and arson all in one day. You're a busy fellow, I note. Cillian scowls. Don't be dramatic. I wasn't trying to murder you. Let's just say you would have suffered severe intestinal distress for several hours afterward, nothing more. I roll my eyes skyward. Let's get this over with. In order for you to keep your mouth shut about what you saw that had absolutely nothing to do with me, you want me to make you my heir? Cillian goes on. I nod once, swirling the cup. Mint leaves and rose petals spiral. Fine, but I plan to live forever, you know. Oh, I don't intend on waiting for you to die, I say lightly. This is the part that might get me killed, so I need to play my cards right. Excuse me? Well, that's an awful lot of risk for me, isn't it? I give him a bland smile. After all, we've only known each other for an hour or so, and you've already tried to poison me. It takes a moment for my words to sink in, as though he's either unable or unwilling to understand. But catch on he does, and his rage sparks instantly. You can't have it now, you horrible little wretch. Well, you did just burn down a building, so I really don't think that's your call now, is it? No mock outrage now. Cillian looks as if he's ready to shove my head down the drain and force me to lick up whatever remains of the poisoned tea. I can see him processing my words, trying like a caged thing to find a way out. Listen, you seem like a nice guy, I say, patting his hand. The gesture clearly infuriates him. But I was the high judge's apprentice. Don't even bother trying to find a loophole. It's not exactly true, but I know as much as if I had been, so why bother with technicalities? Cillian's shoulders slump. It's a temporary defeat, however, and I know it. This boy does not seem like the type to give up easily. I take it you have no family ability? Cillian finally asks, eyes narrowed. My father won't tell me his gift until I'm of age, I say finally. It's both true and not true. I never knew what my father's gift was, but only because it wasn't meant for me. So you have no magic? Cillian concludes. Not yet. Well, then you know as well as anyone that magic cannot be taught. It must be passed down, bestowed as a gift upon an heir, usually a blood relative. Which is what you're going to make me, I interject. Cillian scowls. Fine, but we're doing this on my terms. If you're going to steal my magic, you'll have to learn how to use it properly first. I refuse to pass such a dangerous gift down to someone unprepared for it. How long will that take? I ask. Cillian considers. Six weeks at least. I don't have six weeks. I burst out, wanting more than anything to smack him across his smug face. I need it now. Unfortunately, this is the same process all magicians must go through. His face is serene. The face of someone who knows they have the winning hand. I'm afraid it's non-negotiable. You're hardly in a place to make demands, I return. He's right, though. If I don't learn the magic first, I could end up killing myself. If I can just get his magic before the final show, which is in two months, I'll be fine. I cross my arms over my chest. I'll let him have this one. All right, I'll let you have four weeks in which to teach me. Six. Five. 
six. He's infuriating. You'll give it to me whenever I'm ready. I snarl, to which he only smirks. All right, he amends, like a saint bestowing a blessing. I'll give you my magic as soon as you've proved you can pass the apprentice's exam. Come back tomorrow and we'll start your lessons. It's too easy. I don't trust him. I want it in blood. Cillian stares. Blood packs are binding, and no amount of magic or hesitation can undo a deal sealed in blood. No. The word breathes out of him, so quiet I almost don't hear. It's that or death, I shrug. Your choice. Who's going to believe you? Cillian growls. The high judge is dead, and you have no evidence. The word of a witness can be confirmed, especially once the crime has been investigated thoroughly. I let my words sink in like hooks. Of course, I am sure you covered your tracks completely, though, and absolutely no damning evidence will come to light during the investigation, thorough arsonist that you seem to be. I lean back, pretending to pick at my fingernails, but secretly watch Cillian closely through my eyelashes. His face is gray as he processes my threat, no doubt going through every last step of the crime in his head exactly as I'd hoped. Fine, he snarls finally. I try not to let my relief show, though it courses through me like a wave. Unfolding a dainty penknife, he slices the palm of his hand, careful to catch the blood that spills from the wound before it can stain the carpet. Delicately, he wipes the knife on a handkerchief before passing it to me, jaw clenched. I draw the same blade across my own palm, trying not to wince at the sudden flash of pain. Cillian scowls as a rivulet of blood escapes my trembling hand, blooming on the periwinkle tablecloth below. I clasp his hand before he can change his mind, sealing the pact. He grips my hand so tight my finger bones crack, but the deal is done. I will be heir to his magic. If he doesn't kill me first. Chapter 9 I come back the next day to find the closed sign in the window and the bookshop dark. Even with my face pressed against the glass, I can't make out any movement beyond a few dust motes floating in the sunlight that the window lets in. I pound on the door until my knuckles are scraped and raw, but no one answers. A jiggle of the door handle reveals a very locked door. Only one thing left to do. Reaching into my pocket, I remove a packet of matches, striking one on the brick facade. The match flares to life instantly, insignificant in the glare of the sun. I wave it across the bottom of the door, the flames licking at the wood eagerly. The wood is old, and the fire devours it quickly, belching smoke as it goes. What in the blazes are you doing? The window jerks open, revealing a livid Cillian. I give him my best smile. I so hate being late to my engagements. Cursing, Cillian disappears into the smoke again, reappearing with a kettle full of water which he attempts to douse the fire with. Although the fire hisses in response, it still takes three more kettles to kill it completely. Cillian stands, staring at his blackened and smoking door before turning to me with a sour look. Do come in. Ducking past the remains of the door, I take a seat in the rose chair and wait expectantly. Cillian takes one look at my folded hands and scowls. You really mean to take my magic, don't you? I smile sweetly. It's a better alternative than the gallows, isn't it? It's clear he never intended to teach me magic at all, of course. But the sooner he understands what will happen if he doesn't teach me, the better. Jaw grinding, he scans the bookshelves with a finger as though he can read the books there by touch. His finger stops on a heavy navy tome that reads Magic, Basics, and Theory on the spine in thick, serious letters. Tugging it out, he thumbs to the first chapter and skims it. My heart thrums. I've wanted this since I was a child, and now I'm finally going to learn how magic, real magic, works. The book lands with a thump in front of me. Start with the first five chapters and we'll go from there. I look up at Cillian in disbelief. 
You want me to read? I thought I'd be learning magic. It's hard to keep the betrayal out of my voice. I'd expected spells and potions, not dusty old books. Cillian casts me an offended look. Magic? Look around you, child. I ignore the child, even though it's rich coming from him. He's easily only seven years older than myself at most, about the same age as my brother Edward would have been. I look around, humoring him. Books, I say flatly. Yes, books, he agrees, impatient. He pulls an ancient text, heavy and worn from the shelf. It's nothing much to look at, but he touches it with something close to reverence, running a finger along its fading print. This book, he says, jabbing it in my direction, both started and ended a war. He replaces it, removing one adjacent. It is slightly less homely, but not much. The spine is cracked from use. This one stayed the hand of a king from executing his unfaithful wife. There's a clunk as he replaces it. And this one, he says, handing me a smaller book, practically a pamphlet leafed in gold, seduced a god. I run my fingers along the gilt. It's a beautiful little book, but I find it hard to believe there's any actual power inside. Cillian holds my gaze, emerald eyes stormy. His voice is little more than a whisper. There is magic in words, power in persuasion. The subtle difference between the words melancholy and sad can unravel a kingdom. Learn to use words with the precision of a sword, and you will have more magic at your disposal than Gantrick the Great. I consider the unassuming little book in my hand still not entirely convinced. Cillian blows out a huff of exasperation. And of course, there's the fancy pointless stuff as well. Snapping his fingers, he lights my entire dress on fire. The flame burns so bright it sears my vision, but doesn't so much as singe. I marvel at the flames, watching them shift and grow without even charring the fabric beneath. Cillian watches me, distinctly annoyed. With another snap of his fingers, the flames disappear, leaving spots in front of my eyes. That was amazing. When can I do that? I ask, checking my dress for even a hint of a burn. Cillian's expression is murderous. You have much to learn, is all he says, shoving his precious book back at me. Read this and we'll meet again in a week. Opportunity comes in the form of an invitation slipped under my door while I bathe. It's a pretentious thing, full of curly cues and gilt, and smells faintly of rose petals. An invitation to dine with the queen. Heart pounding, I finger the elegant script bearing my name. The last time the king chose a new jester, he invited all his favorite acts to a feast. It would seem the queen is following in her husband's footsteps. But what to wear to such an event? Recalling the queen's stuffy attire, I dress in the most formal dress I have. Another borrowed gown from backstage at the bleached skull. The entire thing is adorned in peacock feathers that shimmer and catch the light. Twisting my hair with a number of pearl pins, I survey my reflection and pray I'm suitable enough to impress a queen. The dinner is held in the beehive, the crown's formal conference room available by reservation only. Upon entering, it's all I can do not to gape. A magnificent gold chandelier, easily the size of the table beneath, takes up half the ceiling. The rest is frescoed with watercolor flowers, and lazy bees buzz across the arched ceiling. The floor is inlaid with the same marble tiles as the rest of the hotel, hexagonal bordered with gleaming gold grout. Delicate tables draped in lace and only large enough to seat four comfortably dot the room. Lush floral centerpieces, sprays of color against the white of the tablecloths adorn the tiny tables. And in the center of it all, practically groaning under the weight, is a table laden with food. My mouth waters at the abundance. I don't even realize I've stopped walking until I'm elbowed from behind. Excuse you? I swallow my apologies as a couple, much more ornately dressed than myself, pushes past. I see you got my invitation. I turn, arms crossed, to face Luke, who looks devastatingly handsome. 
He's foregone his usual gaudy blood red costume for a sleek charcoal suit with gold thread. It's obvious he shaved too, his jawline sharp. Without the usual coal lining them, I can finally make out the thick lashes that line his amber eyes. Your invitation? But it suddenly makes perfect, painful sense. Why would the queen summon a mediocre performer like me when she has the entire noose to choose her jester from? Luke smiles, pleased that I've caught on so quickly. Forgive me. I do so love to watch you make a fool of yourself, though. I grind my teeth, wishing I had something to stab him with. Go to hell. His eyes glitter. Isn't it interesting how the prickliest cacti have the most beautiful blooms? What's really interesting is how poison can taste just like honey, I respond. Instead of provoking him as I'd intended, however, my words seem only to amuse him. To my surprise, he takes my arm, guiding me toward the tables. You know what they say about rattlesnakes, right? If you waste all your time trying to kill the snake that bit you, you'll die from the venom. I tighten my grip on his arm, nails biting into the thick fabric of his suit. The only question is, which of us is the rattlesnake? I ask as we make our way to one of the tables farthest from the queens, on the outskirts of the room. Luke leans in, adjusting my cheap necklace, lips brushing my ears. Isn't it obvious? I shrug him away, ignoring the way my ear still burns. Oh dear, no room for you, Luke says, flicking one of the table cards. Perhaps you can have the leftovers once we're finished. He's gone before I can respond, lean figure cutting back toward the center of the room. I bite my tongue so hard I taste blood as he takes a seat at the queen's table, where there is only room for three besides the queen herself. The realization hits me with the force of a train. The queen doesn't even know I exist. Without Luke's invitation, I wouldn't even be here. His supposed chivalry was just an excuse for him to grind me under his snakeskin boots. I clench my teeth, hugging the wall as the true guests take their seats. The competition has yet to begin, and I'm already losing. I should leave, but I'm frozen, watching as the guests taste the first course Slices of raw salmon, so thin they're transparent, laid gracefully over a mouthful of rice, sprinkled with roe and garnished with a bite of ginger. As we are so far inland, seafood is the height of luxury. My mouth waters watching. It's been more years than I can count since I last had fish, and the sight of Luke savoring his own food as he chats with the queen rankles me. Peacock feathers are bad luck, you know. I look up to see a dour-looking girl staring at me from across the table with what is apparently deep disapproval. I'd been so caught up in watching the queen, I hadn't even noticed the nearby table watching me. Limp curls frame the girl's scowling face, and her fur dress is so tight that it squeezes her visible flesh like a sausage casing. She's dotted in a number of large moles, like constellations. I don't believe in luck. I say, throwing her a glittering smile. Her lips purse. The nerve of these servers, she mutters to the woman next to her. See if I tip her. How's that for luck? They both break into amused titters. Because of course, even here, she thinks I'm nothing more than a serving girl. I clench my fists, hating Luke with every fiber of my being. There's a seat here. A young woman, electric purple hair sliced in a bob seated at an empty table nearby, gestures to the seat next to her. It's obvious why it's empty. A giant black panther is sprawled on the floor next to it. I hesitate as the panther eyes me, but the girl's brown eyes sparkle. He won't hurt you, she says, rubbing the panther's silky ears. Not unless I tell him to, of course. She winks. The words are anything but reassuring, but the smile beneath them does the trick. I slide into the empty seat. Thank you, I say, face still burning from my interaction with Luke. Someone else must have stolen my seat. Happens all the time, the girl says, mouth twitching into a smile. Don't let it get you down. I'm Yasmin, big cat trainer at the Panther. 
She extends a hand, which I seize gratefully. I've heard of Yasmin. She was a big deal on the noose a few years ago, a longtime headliner. I'm Mirage. A laugh from the queen's table catches my attention. I'm just working out an excuse to drop by and introduce myself, make her notice me when the queen stands up. The room instantly quiets, the clinking of silverware and side conversations evaporating into expectant silence. Thank you all for joining me. Her voice is so quiet I have to strain to hear her. She's exchanged her heavy garb for the summer clothing of the North. Lighter, but no less formal. As you all know, I will be taking my husband's place as judge for the position of Jester. This competition was very important to my husband. He loved a good show more than anything. From the little I've gathered about her, the queen does not share this particular passion with her late husband. She looks down at the tablecloth as though steadying herself. I expect tears, but none come. And when she looks up again, her face is as unreadable as stone. I look forward to the performances. Several of the male guests and even one female leap up to assist the queen as she sits again. But it's Luke's hand she takes with a grateful smile. My stomach clenches. I study the queen from my place in the corner. Every other bite is interrupted by yet another performer eager to introduce themselves. I wonder how many of these introductions she's been forced to sit through already. Her eyes are glazed, her gestures the result of years of etiquette training, automatic. In a room full of the elite of Oasis, she looks bored. Death before boredom. It's the motto of the jester. Anyone can be jester, magic or no. All the late king really cared about was who could entertain him best. The last jester wasn't even a performer, she was a chef. Flavia hailed from the East Isles, and word on the noose was that her iced coconut cakes were so good. A fight once broke out at the king's dessert table over the last one, ending in the death of a courtier. This is the first time a jester is to be chosen since the king's death. It's been seven years since the king's selection, and three years since the queen retired the chef shortly after her husband's death. Whatever the king felt about entertainment, it's obvious his wife does not feel the same. I'm on my feet, across the room before I have time to plan, before I have time to remember I don't belong here. Luke catches sight of my approach and nudges his neighbor. I ignore the satisfied smirk that sweeps across his face and drop a heavy knife next to the queen's dish with a thunk. Startled, she looks up. Your majesty, have you ever played hilt or blade? The guard across the room straightens, hand drifting to the revolver tucked neatly in his waistband. The queen stares at the knife, then me. I beg your pardon? It's a game. You pick one person at the table and ask them to choose, hilt or blade. I don't believe I've played. Is there a problem, your highness? The guard materializes next to my shoulder, grabbing me not so gently. I jerk away, but his grip is iron. It's only a game, relax. Can't you see how bored she is? The queen considers me. For one terrifying moment, I'm sure she'll arrest me. Instead, her face smooths and she waves away the guard. It's been a long time since I've experienced the many amusements and pleasures Oasis has to offer. Let her continue. The guard lets go reluctantly, but does not resume his position at the door, choosing instead to station himself directly behind the queen. Picking up the dagger, I point it directly at Luke, who chokes on a mouthful of shark fin soup and scrambles to regain his composure. Hilt or blade? Luke's eyes, which are watering from coughing, dart to the queen, and I know I have him. There's no way he'll refuse to play now. He straightens, clearing his throat. Hilt, obviously. Very well, give me your hand. Luke cautiously stretches his hand across the table. It's warm, and I can make out the steady pulse beneath. Quickly, I prick his fingertip, just enough to draw blood, and let it drip onto the hilt before he can pull his hand away. Now you must reveal a secret to the entire table. 
The queen's eyes jump from me to Luke and back again. Luke considers me, eyes narrowed. And if I lie? This is a truth blade. I set the dagger on the table so he can make out the ruby eye on the hilt. If you lie, we'll all know, and you'll be forced to play blade instead. Something tells me I won't like blade much more, Luke says, giving me a lazy smile. Although I do wonder if that cheap trinket can truly detect a lie with nothing more than a shiny glass ruby. I should have known that with his expensive taste, he'd be the first to pick out the faux gemstone. Scowling, I rub at the chipped stone as if I can make it real by wishing hard enough. Just spill your secret already. Luke's mouth twitches in amusement. Hmm, let's see. I don't know if I even have any secrets. I'm quite an open book, you know. Chuckles erupt from the tables around us. At this point, most everyone nearby has started to watch the proceedings with great interest. Oh, there is one thing. He pauses for effect, and the room is so quiet, you could hear a snake slither. And I wonder when this became his show and not mine. I'm in love with you. Even though I'm expecting something ridiculous, the words are still a punch to the gut. There's not a hint of deception in those golden eyes. They burn as he watches me as ravenous as a wolf. Catcalls and whistles fill the room as my face heats. Lie, I respond, showing him the hilt where the false ruby glows as red as my face. Of course it is, Luke says, smile sharp enough to slice. Just testing the veracity of your truth blade. Since you lied, now you must play blade. Luke's smile never wavers. Pray tell us how. You must throw the knife at a target of my choosing. If you miss, you'll be forced to remove an appendage of your choice. I let the words sink in, enjoying the way his eyes tighten at the corners. It's a good thing I am an excellent marksman with a knife, Luke says, draining his glass. Well, what bullseye would you like me to hit then? A crystal from the chandelier, perhaps? The pearls on Madame Bouvier's necklace? More chuckles. I wait until he's finished peacocking. I want you to hit me, right here. I tug at my bodice, revealing the tender skin below my collarbone. Enough to tease, but not enough to start a scandal. The shock on his face is delicious. He doesn't even protest when I hand him the knife hilt first. He just stares at my collarbone as if befuddled. You can't possibly be serious, he says finally, looking up, all traces of bravado gone. Of course I am, I say, affecting an innocent look. After all, who better than a master marksman? Luke scowls and twirls the knife. Fine. Stand where you will, then. I take my place several tables down, where even if he misses dreadfully, no one else will be in range. Ready when you are? First, he weighs the knife in his left hand. Then, as if unsatisfied, he switches it to the right. He aims, then lowers the knife again, and cracks his neck. Before we're all dead, if you please, I say dryly, and the knife comes at me so fast I hardly have time to prepare. True to his bragging, he hits the intended target dead on, and I drop like a sack of rocks on impact. There's a flurry of chairs scraping, gasps, and one shattered glass. And then Luke is by my side, carefully lifting me to a sitting position. Is she dead? The queen. I'd be touched at her concern if I didn't currently have a knife lodged in my chest. I can heal her. Luke. He's pale but confident as he pulls at the hilt. His face is dismayed as it slides out, revealing not a gaping wound beneath but unblemished skin. What in the? Trick knife, I smirk, standing up easily. For the group, I demonstrate the retractable blade. The magnetic strip concealed beneath the bodice of my dress ensured the knife would stick once thrown. It's a cheap trick indeed, but judging by Luke's bloodless face, it had its intended effect. Applause rings out and I don't miss the queen joining in the clapping. 
nor do I miss the murderous expression on Luke's face as he tosses the fake dagger onto a table and stalks back to his seat. I cast him out of my mind, dropping into a dramatic bow. Thank you for playing. My name is Mirage, and I'll be performing at the Saguaro tomorrow night. Remember who entertained you during this fascinating dinner when you consider your choice for Jester. The applause is deafening. I want to enjoy the moment, but I can't seem to erase the image of Luke's frightened face as he pulled out the dagger. I thought for sure he'd see the dagger for what it was, a clever fake, just like me. It's not even a real truth blade. It's ruby eye controlled by a carefully concealed button. Luke's confession could have been the absolute truth, and that cheap blade would never have been able to tell the difference. Just like me. Chapter 10. The next morning, I am early again for my lesson with Cillian, but this time he is prepared. He answers the door before I can even raise a hand to knock, gesturing wordlessly for me to follow him down the street. Intrigued, I follow him all the way to the outskirts of Oasis, where there are more tumbleweeds than tourists. Here. Satisfied, Cillian cracks his knuckles. Out here, there is nothing to distract you. I have eliminated every external force. I see nothing that would make this a good spot to learn magic. The land around us is barren for miles. Nothing but red rock and scrubby bushes. Flies buzz around my head, the sun beats down on us. I'm fairly certain Cillian insisted on having our lesson outside in the middle of summer, not to eliminate external influences, as he claimed, but to convince me to give up on our lessons. But I would spend a week in the desert if it meant I'd have my own magic. I want you to close your eyes and picture your reason for summoning the magic. Why do you need it? I do as he says, shutting my eyes. There are many reasons for wanting the magic, but one in particular surfaces from the murk of my mind, floating to the top like a dead log. I want to be liked. It's the most honest answer I know how to give. That's a terrible reason. My eyes fly open. Cillian looks offended. Magic is not about being liked. It's to be used for noble purposes, like getting rid of disease or furthering mankind's progress. Oh, like you're furthering mankind by setting buildings ablaze? I snap, my face red. Cillian pours iced tea from a thermos, his face a mask. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. He doesn't offer me any of the tea, even though he must know how thirsty I am. Sweat trickles down the back of my neck, and my mouth is gritty from lack of moisture. Taking a long draw, he smirks as I swallow reflexively at the sight of the amber liquid. Concentrate, Cillian scolds, clearly enjoying himself. Clear your mind. Feel the magic. I don't have any magic. It takes every ounce of willpower I have not to strangle him. It's clear he's not taking any of this seriously. I could report you at any time. I remind him as he snaps open a massive umbrella and takes a seat in the shade beneath it. Sure, sure, he says, taking another pull from his thermos and removing a dainty cookie from his shirt pocket. He takes a delicate bite and looks at me, eyebrow raised. Well, are you concentrating? What's the point of all this? You're just mocking me. I jab a finger at his cookie. And if I can't pass the apprentice's exam, I'm going to shout from the top of the crown what you did. Oh, relax, Cillian says, dusting cookie crumbs from his trousers. Just having a bit of fun. You can hardly deny me that luxury. Sweat trickles down one temple as I glower at him. Pushing up his glasses, which have slid down his nose, he leaves the umbrella in the sand and turns to me. All right, I actually did prepare a real lesson and it would be a shame to let all that preparation go to waste. I roll my eyes, but relief courses through me. I can threaten all I want, but if he doesn't care if I reveal his secret, I lose any hold I have over him. Magic is power. Power over your fellow men, power over the elements. That power should never be used without accountability. 
I relax, nodding. This I understand. My father's entire job was built on holding people accountable for their misuse of magic. Which is why you need a good reason to use your power, or at the very least, not a harmful reason. Cillian continues, oblivious to the heat. His messy black curls gleam in the sunlight as he paces in the sand. Being liked isn't harmful, I counter, wishing he'd let me have some of his tea. I lick my lips, which are salty from sweat. Not inherently, no, Cillian says. I can sense a but. But the need to be liked is like a disease. To what lengths will you go to impress others? What lines will you cross? What parts of yourself will you shed just for a taste of approval? I study my feet, pretending his question doesn't make me uncomfortable. I'd never considered how far I'd go to impress. There was never a set limit, just a goal the goal of being acknowledged by the crown. And I'd do anything for that. I'm sure you can see why there's a problem, Cillian says almost gently. With true power, there are few, if any, limits. Which is why you must set the bar yourself. Hold yourself accountable. Because if you don't, who will? Not the high judge, I think. The only man with more power than a king sentenced to execution for his own loss of control. I want you to think about your reason for using magic. Come back with a good one next week, something better than being liked. Cillian thrusts a mountain of books at me and I curse, struggling under the sudden weight. Oh, and read these. Cillian's words follow me all the way back to the saguaro. What are my limits? Deep down, I know there is no cost too high, nothing I wouldn't sacrifice. The bruising on my chest from Luke's knife throw is spectacular, a colorful reminder of the cost I paid to get the queen's attention. And now that I have it, I need to make sure my first show is worth the sacrifice. I need something new, something I haven't used on the streets that people haven't seen before. Nothing impresses crowds more than novelty which is how I find myself with a sword three inches down my throat. I know sword swallowing is possible. I'm not completely insane. There was a street performer several years ago with a similar act on the noose, who'd styled himself as the bottomless pit. The pit was exactly what you'd expect from a man who claimed to swallow anything. Massive, built like the Bajou wrestlers of the South, and completely covered in tattoos. According to local legend, which I suspect was fueled by the pit himself. Each tattoo was something he had once swallowed, the most impressive being the 20-inch flaming sword that bisected his entire back. When I'd asked him how he did it, he'd told me the trick was to go slowly. Even the slightest movement could rip apart the esophagus, he'd warned, jowls quivering. So it was very important to relax. And never, ever, really swallow. How he could relax with a live porcupine wriggling in his esophagus was beyond me. Of course, he'd probably used magic too. Nothing I can do about that part, though. Thankfully, I don't have to worry about being accused of stealing his act, because the pit died mid-show a little over two years ago. Ironically, it wasn't the lit torch halfway down his gullet that did him in, but heart failure. The sword I'm using is thin barely an inch across, dulled at the edges, but still sharp at the tip. It doesn't hurt exactly, but it is terribly uncomfortable. The only problem is I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. I have my head tipped all the way back to make my esophagus as open as possible. The sword tickles my gag reflex, which threatens to reject it, as well as my lunch, at any moment. It occurs to me then, mouth flooded with saliva, that I should have started with something easier. A butter knife, maybe, or my finger. Eyes watering, I carefully pull the tip of the sword from my throat, gagging as it slides up over my tongue. I mark the measurement on the sword, pleased when I realize it's a centimeter and a half farther than the last time I tried it. I pull out a notebook and jot down my observations. Find something smaller to train the muscles of the throat. Try lubrication. I have what seems like thousands of notebooks just like this one, full of these kinds of notes. Everything I've learned as a performer. 
Some are falling apart, I've used them so extensively, with loose pages that flutter out when opened and script that's faded from years of desert heat and obsession. In any case, how can I expect to be the best if I don't learn everything there is to know? I tap the pen on my teeth, wondering what I can use for lubrication, but overall pleased with my progress. Stretching, I eye the tourists that wind through the streets from my grimy window. It's been a while since I've been to the Panther, I realize. It's time I paid the devil a visit. My water sits untouched in front of me, the ice long ago melted. I haven't come to the Panther to drink or dance, as most people do. Instead, I'd hoped that being in Luke's territory, the den of the lion, so to speak, might help me come up with a way to beat him. But I have nothing more than a headache from the strobing lights and pounding music of the club. I'm about to leave when a flash of electric purple hair catches my eye. Seated alone is Yasmin, the girl from the Queen's party. It's hard to miss that razor-sharp bob and the panther lounging at her feet. I approach her, glad to see a familiar face. She doesn't bother to look up, just continues reading a book, long brown legs crossed on the table in front of her. I sign autographs every night at six in the lounge, she says automatically. I'm not here for an autograph, I say, flustered. She looks up, blinking, as though just remembering where she is. Mirage. The panther lets out a velvet growl. Sit, she instructs the big cat. He does so balefully, yawning, the lights from the strobes catching on one gleaming fang. A thick tail flicks my ankle, and it's all I can do to remain nonchalant. Hilt or blade, she muses, snapping the book shut. That was a riot. Thanks. She's not rude or condescending like some of the other big shot performers are. Anything to make the devil squirm, I say. Personally, I'd prefer him writhing to squirming. The book lies forgotten next to an empty glass, her spot marked with a napkin. Yasmin's smile is sharp, slicing. The panther licks at one enormous paw, his golden eyes fixed on me. I'm not surprised she and Luke don't get along, even though they share a stage. Sibling rivalries, as they're known in the business, tend to crop up when two acts compete for ticket sales. And I know of more than a few theater managers who play off these natural rivalries to drive up sales. Her fingers tighten on the edge of the table before she remembers herself. She flags down a serving girl and grabs a bright blue drink, then gestures to me. Thirsty? I shake my head, but she grabs one anyway, pushing it toward me. The liquid inside is tropical and smells like the ocean, if the ocean were made of fruit. Word on the noose is you're Luke's biggest competition for Jester. Her dark eyes survey me over her drink. I take a sip of my own, hoping to downplay the thrill her words send through me. Her fingers tap her glass absently to the heavy beat of the music as she considers me. I'm having a party on the rooftop tonight, she says finally. You should come. I catch the stupid smile that threatens to cover my face just in time and settle instead for a casual nod. I've waited my whole life to be acknowledged by someone like Yasmin, an actual headliner. I'll see if I can make it. There's no way I'm missing it. Yasmin smiles, pleased, and leans back to sip her drink. Can you imagine a street performer actually winning Jester? She shakes her head at the thought, scratching under the panther's bristly chin. That's the plan, I say. Oh, it's not that I don't think you can, she says placatingly. I just don't know if Luke's ego could handle it. I laugh. In the spirit of friendship, I take a sip of the blue drink. It feels like a thousand tiny bubbles fizz in my bloodstream. So what's your plan, she asks, leaning in conspiratorially. I mimic her without meaning to. What plan? She lets out an exasperated sigh. For beating Luke, of course. Well, I've got a fantastic show lined up. Yasmin's already shaking her head. 
That's not enough. You've got to find out his weakness and exploit it. You mean, like, cheating? I'm not above it, but a weird part of me wants to win without cheating. Prove that I'm good enough. Oh, you have got a long way to go, she sighs. You're not on the streets anymore. Listen, you want to beat Luke? Check the storage closet backstage at 6.15. She winks at me surreptitiously and nudges the big black cat with a toe. Come on, Eco. We've got a show to get ready for. 6.23. Crouched in the dust backstage at the Panther near a box of masks, I'm beginning to feel a fool. The glow from Yasmin's unexpected attention fades more and more with each passing minute, leaving me with something like a hangover. I wouldn't be surprised if Luke himself were somehow behind the whole thing. Yasmin, just another of his plants. I'm about to leave when a loud retching sound comes from inside the storage closet. I tap lightly on the door. All right in there? The voice that answers is hoarse. Go away. Nerves? I ask sympathetically, leaning against the door. More retching. Poor sop. Twisting the handle, I tug open the door. And there, hunched over a mop bucket, pale and shaking, is Luke. My hand flies to my mouth. Devils! Luke looks up, wan, dragging a hand across his mouth. Of course it's you, he says, resigned. Are you okay? I ask, even though it's obvious he's not. He'd better pull himself together. I glance at the clock. His show is in less than 30 minutes, and I can't help the eagerness that rises inside of me. If Luke is too sick to perform. It's some bad quail or something, he mutters, pushing the bucket away. I furrow my brow. You have stage fright. It dawns on me with certainty. This was what Yasmin wanted me to see. Luke doesn't bother to contradict me, just holds his head in his hands as though he can stop the shaking that way. It's almost too much. The great Luke, performer of death-defying feats, afraid of the stage. Go on, then, Luke says, waving me away, still pale. You know you're dying to tell everyone. You finally have an advantage over me. May as well use it. I pause. He's right, but it feels so cheap. I lean against the door, taking in the sight of my enemy brought to his knees from fear. It should be delicious, but it's more pathetic than anything. Why do you do it? Luke looks up as though surprised to see me there still. What, vomit up a perfectly good meal before every performance? I swallow back a smile. Yes and no. Luke studies me for a moment. Do you take me for a fool? Now I don't bother fighting the grin that slides across my face. You are competing for the spot of Queen's Fool. Jester, he corrects. Same thing. A small smile curves Luke's lips, although it's a touch bitter. True enough. He's silent for so long, I assume my question will remain unanswered until he blows out a sigh. I hate performing. The admission is a shock. I think of his face, the light that seems to suffuse him when he performs. I'd always assumed we were the same, he and I, two ends of the same spectrum. He may hate performing, but he's a born actor. He goes on. Every single act, I wonder if it will be my last. The one where I slip up and get myself killed for real. Can't you just heal yourself? I ask, brow crinkled. Luke's laugh is hollow. All magic has limits. If I overstrain my magic one day or don't give myself adequate time to heal from a previous act, or even just let my heart go too long in between beats. He shrugs letting the rest of the thought dangle like the feet of a hanged man. Reeling, I try to process what he's telling me. I'd always assumed Luke was invincible. Even I don't know all my limits, he admits, playing with one of the many silver rings that adorn his slender fingers. He falls quiet for a moment, as if sobered by the thought. 
but this job, the position of jester. I need it more than anything, and I'll do anything to get it. His eyes bore into me. Perhaps we don't have the same motives, but the fire that burns within us is the same. Why? The question rouses him, and he seems to recall who he's talking to. I can see the mask slip back on in the guise of an easy smile. Same as you. But it's not. I don't push him further, though. One of the stagehands scurries toward us, startling when he sees me there. Master Luke, you said to let you know if anyone came backstage. I'd noticed, Luke says dryly. A little late, but I appreciate the warning nevertheless. The stagehand has the decency to look chastised. Shall I escort her out? You'll do nothing of the sort. I cross my arms over my chest, glowering at the little man. Luke slips his own arm around me, guiding me away before I can so much as protest. I'll handle this, Johan. Johan gives him a short bow before backing away cautiously, throwing me nervous looks as he does so. You stink, I say, shoving Luke away. Reaching into my bag, I pull out a tin of ginger candies. Take one of these, it'll help with the nausea, and your breath. Luke smiles at my wrinkled nose as he pops in the candy. Are you always this charming? Just be glad I don't poison you. He doesn't try to put his arm around me again. Sneaking a glance at him from the corner of my eye, I absorb the fact that Luke is not who I thought he was. How much of Luke is the mask? How much is really him? Although I hate to admit it, I'm fascinated with this new side of him. I tell myself it's simply knowing he has a weak point. But there's something more. Something I can't name. Something I'm terrified to name. Chapter 11 Success. It suffuses Edward with warmth, despite the ice-cold drink his father presses into his hands. His brain feels like a wrung sponge. His eyes are grainy from exhaustion, but elation buoys him. A perfect score. Sure, he'd hoped and studied and prayed for as much, but even he would have been a fool to believe he could actually achieve it. Only two perfect scores existed in the history of the apprentice's exam. Not even his father could claim such an honor. Come, have another drink, boy. Joy, uncharacteristic in his father's voice, seems to fill the whole room. Guests, colleagues of his father's, well-known aristocrats, as well as several high-level court officials, circle him like planets, offering hearty congratulations and drinking to him. Edward feels as if he will drown in all the praise. It would not be an unpleasant way to go. He does not say no when the daughter of the Lord General asks him for a dance. Tonight is his night, and he will dance with every girl here. They swirl, the moonlight above the courtyard sparkles in the auburn of his partner's hair and his heart squeezes at the absolute perfectness of the moment. A flash of burgundy catches his eyes near the tables. Excusing himself, Edward crouches near one of the refreshment tables, lifting the hem of the exquisite lace cloth that covers it. Lisette, tucked neatly under the table and away from their father's line of sight, startles when she sees him. She recovers quickly, donning a scowl. Go away. Edward smothers the smile that rises unbidden to his lips at the sight of her. She has avoided him for weeks now. I had planned to offer you some of this lovely eclair, but if you're certain. He lets the gauzy fabric fall, nodding as Madame Oakley strides by, giving him a curious look. Wait. Schooling his expression, Edward lifts the tablecloth once more. Yes? You can come in. It is grudging, but it is an invitation at least. Forcing his long limbs to obey, he crams himself under the table with his sister. She extends an impatient hand into which he deposits half the promised pastry. I'm still mad at you, Lisette says around a gooey mouthful. And you didn't even invite me to your party. 
Edward smiles at the chocolate smear on her nose. You're right, that was very rude of me. Sucking the frosting from her fingers, Lisette nods, solemn. I shall never forgive you. Never? Edward leans against the wooden pedestal of the table, trying his best to keep his cramping legs hidden. Never, Lisette affirms, fixing him with narrowed eyes. Her curled hair is messy, and she wears only a night shift. Even in the dark, he can make out the pinpricks on her fingers, souvenirs from her new apprenticeship with Madame Luell. Inspired, Edward leans in, conspiratorial. What if I made you my heir? Her brow furrows almost comically. What? I have to retire sometime, right? He shrugs, as though this is a completely normal conversation they're having and not a complete upheaval of decades of inheritance tradition. When I do, I'll pass my magic on to you. You, you can't, Lisette stammers, eyes wide. You're supposed to pass it on to your children. I don't have to. Edward says, tugging one of her curls. Captain Flint didn't. He didn't have any kids, Lisette argues. But he can see the way the idea has caught hold in her mind, ensnared her. How about this then, Edward says, thinking fast. If I have any children one day, your future nieces or nephews, when you're ready to retire, you pick your favorite and make them your heir. He sits back, pleased. Sure, his future wife might hate him one day for this little agreement, but Edward can't think of anyone he'd rather choose for his heir. Lisette scrutinizes him, face screwed up, as if waiting for him to yell, gotcha. I mean it, little Liz, Edward says gently, grasping one of her warm hands in his. If you want it, it's yours. Her mouth opens and closes as though the night breeze has stolen the words from her. Yes, please. Edward laughs as she wraps him in a stranglehold, his head knocking into the underside of the table. Easy, easy, I've got a party to get back to. Lisette releases him, unable to hide the smile that has overtaken her face. And you should get back to bed before Papa sees, Edward adds, doing his best to look stern. He's probably droning on about international law to Lord Danley, Lisette says, rolling her eyes. He'll never even know I'm here. Edward stifles a smile. Very well, but if you get caught, don't you dare drag me into it. I won't, Lisette promises. Smiling, Edward discreetly lifts the tablecloth, looking for any courtiers in the nearby vicinity, before sliding awkwardly out from underneath. Oh, good evening again, Madam Oakley, he says, brushing the dust from his suit, as the old dowager stares at him from a nearby table. A hand tugs at one trouser leg, and Edward looks down. Edward, Lisette's stage whisper is loud enough to attract the attention of several courtiers milling by, who as a courtesy pretend not to see the daughter of the high judge hiding under a refreshment table. Yes? Her gaze is earnest. I was never really mad at you, you know. He leans down and chucks her chin. I know. It's too bad that Lizette's opportunity to impress the queen at dinner was muddied by her mercurial feelings for Luke. At least she can still claim the victory. And her new allies might help to give her a real shot at becoming Jester, as long as she can keep her eyes on the prize. Stay tuned for more. So don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen to Jester now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. You can find Brielle Porter on social media at Briellums. And make sure you follow us at CamCat Books. Tune in to hear all our audiobooks as we release them right here on CamCat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here, but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone, but don't worry, the audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major retailers. CamCat Unwrapped also offers other CamCat books as podcasts. 
Also, check out our background episodes where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books, including interviews with the authors, editors, and other industry professionals. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. Tune in again to CamCat Unwrapped, because CamCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.